Hello again, and welcome. Michael Pozzola here. I'd like to welcome you to this edition of the Value Capping Rant. This is the 2022 Preakness Stakes edition. Now, before we get into what we're talking about, what do you mean value capping and all of that, and who the heck are you to be talking about the races? Uh, for those of you who just want to know, who do you like? Who does your software like? Here you go. Now, I want you to sit down. Sit down. Because, you know, Epicenter looks good <laughs> in the Preakness. I mean, what the heck, he's a 6 to 5 morning line favorite, probably won't go off um, at that price. Um, but there are some interesting possibilities among um, some of the other horses, and I'll go through each of the horses, pace scenario, and all of that. But I, I'm a little reticent when... Um, when the software, and which was my approach that I've kind of put into the software, which was to give horses every benefit of the doubt to try to find, you know, a, a hidden gem. And when you do that, and the quote-unquote obvious or strong horse still comes up way on top of the rest of the field, and here's the thing, I've got three of the four morning line horses, epicenter, simplification, and early voting, at the top of the line. In other words, I'm agreeing with the public. Now, there there might be one bet um, that, depending on what the price, may be profitable. Okay. So, and we'll get into what uh, all this stuff means, but for those of you who just wanted to tune in and say, hey, who does he like? Thanks for watching. Um, don't forget uh, the... Um, the younger generation tells me to remind you to subscribe and like, or I don't know if you can find that wherever it is. <laughs> okay, so um, when it looks like the value cappers' odds, um, or, or if you're not using any software, it doesn't matter. It, you know, you go through the race and you say, well, I like these two horses, and you look up and they're eight to five and five to two. What, what do you have there? I don't believe, this is my own thing, that five to two is enough of a price to get to offset all the risks in a race. So when you agree with the public, what do you do? Well, the eight to five has got to beat the five to two, so I'll slam that. And, you know, okay, fine. Um, but we'll, we're going to take a closer look to see if any of the VIPs, and I'll show you what constitutes one of those, value investment potential. In other words, what value capper does is points out, hey, this horse may have potential. So here's what I'm looking at. Pimlico, race 13 on May 21st, uh, 2022. I, I have three potentials, okay? Epicenter, on top of the line, with a gap, looks like a strong cold. Gee, Michael, that's why you're such an expert. I would have never thought of that. Who could have seen Epicenter? Okay. There you go. But I, I think simplification, creative minister, to an extent, Happy Jack, um, are worth looking at. And, and I, I think I've settled on one of them. Uh, indulge me, if you will, for those of you who are just tuning in to this channel and don't know me. My name is Michael Pozzola. I have been writing about and teaching about this great game for the last 30-odd years. I'm the author of the best-selling handicapping book, Handicapping Magic, uh, co-author of the classic Pace Makes the Race, um, the creator of the original online racing form way back in, geez, 1994. And it's now um, up at posttimedaily.com. Um, the creator of the Value Capper software, the software I'm going to be showing you. If you're interested in the principles of value capping, uh, more than I can go to in this video, there's a free video course at valuecapper.com. And look, yeah, it, it, there are good lessons. The first two videos especially. The last one goes into the software and you know why you might want to get it and what comes with it and all of that. Skip that if you don't want to. But the first couple uh, are on the principles of value capping, and I think you'll find them useful no matter what style of handicapping you use, because they're based on these fundamental bedrock um, principles. At least I believe they're bedrock principles to beat the modern game, because everyone's got decent numbers. 
didn't used to be like that. So the value capping framework is to bet horses you like that the public shouldn't. In other words, we find something about it that, that we like that the public shouldn't like. Preferably, if you can find a vulnerable favorite. In other words, a horse the public is betting, but maybe it, it uh, you know, has got something wrong. Maybe it ran a little too hard in its last race. Maybe, um, maybe it's dropping in class after just winning, and so forth. Um, crucially, you have to wait for your price. No price, no bet. And then the last one is let the bet make you. In other words, play at the game long enough. Use the tool, whatever that tool is, long enough to get a felt sense of when uh, the bet is making you. It's not like the mind going, I got this figured out, I want it on. No, it's like, oh yeah, that one. This is just a very quiet thing. Oh yeah, that one. Okay. And uh, fortunately or unfortunately, there's no way to program that into any system, into any software, into anything. That's part of this apparently human machine. Okay. So uh, a couple of um, cautionaries. This is not a touting video, I'm not a tout. I don't pick horses. Uh, I'm doing this to demonstrate the principles of value capping. Number two, I'm making this video on Wednesday morning before the Preakness. I don't have scratches and I don't have weather changes. Pardon me. So that can um, uh, potentially uh, make it a different scenario. Uh, looking at weather.com, uh, Saturday looks like it's going to be warm and sunny. But, you know, weathermen. And you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. Software, numbers, any kind of, anything you use to measure, predict, uh, do all of that. Well, they're not infallible. They're not crystal balls. You can't actually predict with 100 degrees, 100% certainty, the outcome of a race. There's always uncertainty. And as a result, price is crucial. All potential value bets are price dependent. Now, I'm going to point to one horse in the Preakness, um, Colt in the Preakness, that may have a chance. I don't know if the price will be there. No, no price, no bet. It's as simple as that. All right, with that said, let's take a closer look uh, at the 2022 Preakness Stakes. And start as I always do because, you know, I'm basically my, my area of what I feel is my expertise is pace analysis, right? Um, and let's look historically at the track profile from Pimlico on a fast track at a mile and three sixteenths, 9.5 furlongs. And what I've done, these are uh, the Preakness Stakes and the, and the Pimlico Special, which is uh, another race run at Pimlico at a mile and three sixteenths. And if you look at um, you look at the last four races, um, stake you know the, the the stakes races run at a mile and three sixteenths. At the B, at the second call, see BL two three lengths last year, Rombauer if I recall. Uh, and then zero zero zero, really up close uh, at the second call, but yet the energy. See those numbers in the 50, 50.23, 50.65. You usually see that in a, on, a, on a turf horse. That's a very that indicates a horse that's very uh, late in its expenditure of energy. Now, uh, if you look. At, okay, so the Rombauer was on top, and then um, in 2020, that was Swiss, uh, Swiss Skydiver, the filly, and then going back to 19, War of Will, uh, before that, Cloud Computing, California Chrome, and Oxbow. But look at, the, look at the second call beaten lengths. I mean, the maximum one was in 2017, and it was from three lengths off. And, and so what we're looking for, what we're looking for, if the track comes up fast, we're looking for a horse that fits the track profile will be one that will run relatively close to the pace, but yet expend its energy late. And it's a very long story about the, the difference between positional uh, pace and velocity pace, which is way too long for me to get into in this video. Now, if the track comes up off, and, and again, all I have are, are four races 
<clears throat> since 2011 that came up sloppy in my database. And it's a little earlier. If you look at the energy, 51.6, 51.3, and then, whoa, uh, 53.03, that was American Pharoah in 2015. Uh, but Exaggerator uh, uh, came from off the pace and Justify on his way to the Triple Crown, wire the field. So two out of the three were wire to wire. So again, we see up close at the second call, a little earlier if the track comes up sloppy. Um, but uh, it strikes me again just how consistent the percentage of energy expenditure, the percentage of energy the horse expends to the second call in the race compared to the uh, total energy in the race, how consistent that's been at a mile and three sixteenths at Pimlico. So it would seem to favor a colt that can run close to the pace and yet expend his, her, it's energy late. And by the way, if you want to leave a comment, I'm always happy to hear a comment, but give me a break on pronouns, please. Okay, I, yeah, I call horses it's sometimes because I don't know them. Um, if I know my dog, I call him him. I don't know these horses. It's perfectly appropriate to call him it. And, of course, some of them, as you know, have chosen different pronouns. And it's very difficult because they don't have that in the past performances yet. Soon to come. Okay. <laughs> Jokester. So that's historical. Now, what's the projected pace scenario? Okay, so historically, we look back, we say, yeah, Freakness, got to be a little, probably close to the pace, run, run a little late. In this race, in the 2022 Preakness, here's how Value Capper sets up um, something called acupressure. Ac acupressure combines both the positional aspect and it adds in the velocity. So it makes the race an unpressured race. Why? Because it looks like the nine, Skippy Longstocking, with that um, velocity in there, could have a long lead. If it runs back to some of the internal fractions that it ran back in Gulfstream, back at Gulfstream, uh, where it was contending with paces at 45 and 110, and that's uh, racehorse speed compared to the rest of this field. So, looking at velocity, that um, that's a possibility. Will that happen? I don't know. You know the jockeys and the trainers and the owners can read the past performances and say, hey, you know, we're not going to let this horse get away. Um, one thing to keep in mind, a horse that I think will take some action early voting uh, is designated as a need to lead horse. That means all its good races were on the lead at both calls. Now, whether Skippy Longstocking runs and gets a loose lead or not, I don't believe early voting will get the lead, and that makes this Colt vulnerable. So from a velocity and position uh, point of view, it's unpressured. Um, when uh, the nine could have an, uh, an easy lead. But positionally, there looks to be a bunch of horses that tend to run close to the pace in the race. So if you look at that those top two boxes, yeah? We got one, two, three, four, five out of the ten, uh, or the nine goals, rather. So the majority of the field that want to be up there kind of close, that means positionally it'll be pressured. I like races where the velocity point of view and the positional point of view both agree. Okay. Otherwise, you've got to say, well, if it goes this way, it goes that way, and this leads to a level of you know, some confusion and some doubt. Yet, it's the preakness, and so you know, I'm going to trudge on. Um, and you will see, uh, maybe you missed it when I showed you the first screen. Uh, there's a lot on this uh, value cap uh, screen, even the summary grid, that there are two projections. One from a positional point of view, could be a pressured race. One from a velocity point of view, could be an unpressured race. So, uh, the software favors the velocity because, you know, look, I believe I have the best numbers that there are, of course, because, you know, I've been developing them over the past <laughs> three decades. 
Um, so I think they're great. So I lean into that. And in doing so, we still get epicenter. We look maybe simplification and now that's and creative minister, maybe Happy Jack. I have some reservations about it, which I'll get to in a second. This is set up from an early bias. If we set it up on a late bias, we say, okay, positionally it's late. I'm gonna I'm gonna look late. Guess what? Epicenter is even stronger. Bigger gap, big, you know. Uh, and, and so forth. And Happy Jack falls completely out of it. Simplification and creative ministers still hanging in there. But again, that gap from five to two to five to one is huge. So it's the same basic set of, you know, three of the four morning line favorites, uh, no matter whether we look at the race from the pressure point of view or the unpressured point of view. All of that in mind, okay, the historical pace analysis, the fact that basically um, the way I'm looking at it, I'm basically agreeing with the public. Let's look at the Colts and the Philly and see some of the details. So let's see if we can get some kind of sense. Now, Epicenter. Um, sorry, you know... Um, let me digress for a minute. In the Derby, uh, Value Capper came up with um, Epicenter and Zandon. I mean, no surprise there. Um, they finished second and third in the Derby, as you know, uh, beaten by a rank outsider, Rich Strike. Uh, could Rich Strike be gotten? You know, I was asked this a couple of times uh, in the comments and other messages I've gotten, and it's like, sure. With enough ratings and enough clickings, and oh look, if you look at this rating, he is the seventh in the field, and you know what? Sure, but that kind of postmortem analysis can lead to the myth, uh, something akin to the myth of Sisyphus, where Sisyphus was doomed to roll a rock up a hill, only to have it roll down the other side, and then he'd have to go and push it up. So you come up with this thing. This is how I got rich strike. I ignored all the conventional stuff, and I, I picked one, um, one rating, and then it was like the sixth or seventh. So I take the top seven in that rating, and then if it also has whatever, you make up a story. We are wonderful machines for making stories, especially about horse racing. I, mean, I could have had that, and then you apply it to the next race that comes up. Aha! Now I've got it, and you apply that, and it's oh, that didn't work. Oh, but wait a minute, if I use that rating plus this one, and then, ah, then I get both of them. And then you slowly build this all up. You roll that rock up the hill. It comes down again when the next one doesn't work out. Look, you can ask me how I know this, okay? I spent years of my life doing that. And I found it's not useful. And I find that people that do that are usually very stressed out about this game. Okay. End of sermon, sorry, but I, I just, it's a cautionary tale. Epicenter is the only, um, can I say, can I say horse, please? Because then I have to say Colt or Philly. Uh, it's the only, <laughs> the only horse in this race that has run or, and at nine and a half furlongs, and it won in the Louisiana Derby. Ran a very, just quite a beautiful race, a very strong number in this field. Uh, in my numbers, in the master pace numbers uh, that are in value capper, I have a target of 163. Uh, Epicenter, in both of its uh, maiden tries, uh, ran that number a little bit. And the Louisiana Derby number was wonderful, which is why value capper put it on top uh, in the Derby. Uh, looking at its uh, running style and, and energy expenditure, Runs close up to the pace, and it has close in the in the Louisiana Derby, close from third by a length and a half. Look at the last two energy expenditures in the Louisiana Derby and the Risen Star. You see that 50 and change? So it's right on the profile. So I've got a horse with strong numbers. I've got a horse that runs positionally uh, where the track profile is, and the energy expenditure is right where the track profile is. This is obviously the cult to beat. Now, simplification is an interesting, interesting cult. Good finish in the Derby. Finished fourth. 
only two and three quarters lengths behind Epicenter. He's got a flexible running style. By that I mean, if you look at the... He's got three wins showing in his past performances. Let's, um, let's discount for a minute the 16-length win in its maiden win where it went wire, basically wire to wire. But he won the Mucho, Mucho Macho Man at Gulfstream wire to wire. And then he came back in the Fountain of Youth and closed from seven by two lengths to six by three quarters of a length to win going away. So this is a flexible running style. I don't think you can say this cult has established that it absolutely loves to run one way or the other. In the Florida Derby, he went out early. In the, uh, in the Kentucky Derby, well, maybe, maybe he had to because he was in the 13th hole and broke 15th and had to come on late. But this is a cult that, that looks like it can run better. Now, if I had to look for a knock on, on this cult, his recent numbers, the numbers that he ran in Florida, the Florida Derby and the Fountain of Youth, were not, by my lights, as good as... Uh, his earlier uh, numbers, the Holy Bull and the Mucho Macho Man, etc. All right, early voting. Now, this is a cult that I think may take a lot of um, a lot of action. May actually wind up to be a second favorite. Uh, it's lightly raced. You know, one it's maiden at first asking. One the withers uh, wire to wire going away. Uh, just missed at the Wood Memorial. Now, <clears throat> the wise guy horse in the Kentucky Derby was Mo Donegal. I must have been approached by a dozen people. Hey, you know, listen, Mo Donegal, Mo Donegal, you know, in, in, in the wood. And look, there was nothing wrong with that number in the wood. As a matter of fact, the 163 that early voting uh, earned from the wood is the top last race number uh, that has been confirmed uh, in this field. And, you know, the energy expenditure on it was good. But, you know, Mo Donegal finished fifth in the Derby, behind even simplification. Uh, if I have a knock about this, is that early voting, as I, I pointed out before from the acupressure screen, uh, has been on a loose lead in its two wins. The maiden, uh, the maiden win and the Withers win, and tried to do the same thing in the wood. I don't believe, by my projections, I don't believe early voting will have a loose lead in this race. May have a tight lead, may have a pressured lead, dependence upon what Skippy Longstockings does. But I don't think we'll have a loose lead. And, and this cult is unproven without a loose lead. Now, again, I'm looking for knocks. I'm looking for, you know, I'm looking among the contenders other than Epicenter, because Epicenter is, I think, a given that it's going to run well in the race. Um, I don't love that uh, that it's a need to lead horse that might not get the lead. How about Happy Jack? Now remember the track profile historically. You need to be up close to the pace and you have to expend that percentage energy late. Well, here's the exact opposite. Here's a colt that is way off the pace at the first and second call and yet expends its energy early. Um, the other thing I noticed, it's got a big number from its maiden special weight win. You see that 167.2? Way out of line with its other numbers. If you play around with the software, you exclude that. How does it look? It drops way out of it. If you set up the race as we did uh, from a pressured point of view, it drops way, way out of it. This is the kind of horse that I would not take to win, uh, would I use it in exotics? Perhaps in trifectas or supers. Creative Minister, another interesting cult. Um, numbers are good, right? We're looking for something around a 163. It's got a 166 last out, a 165 in its first start <clears throat> lifetime. It's only got three races. Again, the numbers are good, but it's only one, a maiden at Keeneland, and then a non-winner's one at Churchill. Oh boy, didn't run as a two-year-old and, and all of that. Um, looks like it likes to close, right? Because 
all three races, it was off the pace. Uh, the first two races were a little early from the point of view of energy expenditure. Last race was, you know, was right there. I don't know. I, I don't know if, if this Colt has it to run against this kind of competition. It's unproven. And yet the numbers are solid and, you know, two wins out of three lifetime races. So I'm not going to dismiss that out of hand, especially not with a 10 to 1 morning line. Ah, secret oath. You know, a uh, really nice win in the Kentucky Oaks. About the only knock I have with this filly, she's five for eight lifetime and so forth, is that her numbers are good. If you look at the last five numbers, 162, eight, right on the target, 164, nine, 163, the one not so great number was the Arkansas Derby, which is the one out of the eight races that she's run lifetime against the boys. So maybe she wasn't feeling well that day. Maybe she didn't like running against the boys. Who knows? All I know is all others are good numbers. The one against the boys are not. I don't know what kind of uh, action it will take. I'm sure people remember will remember uh, Wayne Lucas's record with uh, fillies in the Triple Crown races. And I have a feeling Secret Oath is going to uh, draw some action as well. Maybe be third favorite behind Epicenter and um, uh, Epicenter and early voting. Sorry. Um, Moving along, let's go through all the, uh, we only have 10, so um, Skippy Longstocking, uh, numbers are good, not great. Never hit that 161. This is another cult coming out of the wood, and I am leaning to dismiss them. Now, if the Wood Memorial horses, they, uh, you know, the cults, they all come running, and you get early voting, you got Skippy Longstocking, and so forth, I'm, I'm losing my bet. Um... He's got one win wire to wire in this maiden, and then it came from way off the pace in a non-winner's allowance, uh, one with a big close. I'm disinclined. Now, now, if you look at the internal fractions on the three one-mile races at Gulfstream, February 4th, January 1st, December 5th, 45 and change, 110, 110 and change, those are fast fractions against which this Colt ran. If it replicates that kind of early speed, he can have a loose lead, and then we have a different race. But again, as I pointed out before, our friends, the jockeys and the trainers, and even the owners, can read a past performance and say, hey, we can't let this, we can't let this one get away. Uh, moving on to uh, Colts that I don't give much of a shot to, Armagnac. Um, it's two wins are in clear leads. It doesn't project to have that kind of lead in the Preakness. In other words, a need to lead um, horse that m probably won't get the lead. And then Fenwick, um, I don't know what to say about it. You know, 11 by 36 lengths in the bluegrass. Uh, it's got one win, a maiden win, wire to wire. Doesn't look like it can get the lead either. So there we are. Now, look, you don't need me or a computer program or fancy numbers to know that Epicenter is the cult to beat. Uh, okay, I mean, strong morning line favorite, uh, the cult that um, beat him in the derby, uh, Rich Strike is not in the race. But at a 6-5 to five morning line, and I, I fully uh, expect Epicenter to be odds-on in the race, 4-5 to five, perhaps, it's just not a good value proposition. Yeah, but I can take one big bet on this can't-lose horse. And there's no such thing as a can't-lose horse. Had an albatross. I think it was an albatross. If, if not, it was the biggest seagull I've ever seen in my life. Fly head-on into a horse at Aqueduct that had like about an eight-length lead in the stretch. Just head-to-head, -head, like, like a... Uh, <laughs> a suicide plane coming in and the horse spooked when I think went over the rail. Whatever it was, it didn't win at uh, 12 to one. Not that I'm bitter about it, but there's no such thing as a can't lose horse, right? So, but Epicenter looks, of course, like the best in this field. 
The question is, can we find value elsewhere? Now, value is not meaning looking down the morning line, hey, look at this horse, 30 to 1s, you know, right? that could do it, it could do it. It's not value playing. Is there a scenario that makes sense? When I look, when I look at the value potentials, when I look at the obvious horses, here's my thinking. Epicenter is obvious and strong. Simplification, finish two and three quarters lengths um, off of that in the Derby. Uh, early voting, I'm going to take a position that it needs the lead. Uh, it's not going to be able to get it. Uh, will I be right or wrong? Don't know. That's the projection. Um, I think the wood, uh, given that Mo Donegal's uh, performance in the Derby and so forth, I'm, I'm hesitant to bet the wood memorial, the horses, the colts coming out of the wood memorial. Um, Happy Jack has got the opposite to the track profile. It's a closer, but yet it expends its energy early. Creative Minister only has a maiden and a non-winner's one win and makes a nice little close. Secret Oath uh, is a big question mark against the Colts. Um, Armagnac needs the lead, may not get it. Skippy Longstocking, uh, who knows, may try to go out and, you know, run <laughs> 22 and change 45 and try to take them all, all the way. Um, that's, to me, that's the big question in the race. And uh, Fenwick, just a wire-to-wire -wire maiden. So what do we do with all of that? Here's my assessment. Epicenter should win. The eight, quote-unquote, should win. Wow, what an expert. How many books again did you write? And how many articles? Hundreds of videos. My God, what a genius. Well, what are you going to do? You know, uh, if you just want price, if you just want long shots, just bet off the board. Look, I got a 20 to 1 and a 31. I'll bet it. The strength of value cappers, it finds the strong horses and it finds the long price horses. And you have to assess whether it's worth a bet. But a 10 to 1, that's my criteria. Uh, okay, well, what if it's uh, 8.9 to 1? Yeah. Something around 10 to 1. I'd look at the 1, simplification. I'd look at it to reverse the finish in the Derby. I mean, after all, they've only fish, finished around three lengths apart in the Derby. You know, second position on epicenter, fourth on simplification. Um, I think the public will go uh, a little stronger uh, on a couple of other uh, of the of the Colts, specifically early voting and um, secret oath. Uh, they may let simplification go for the mere fact that hey, it just lost to epicenter. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping for something in the eight to one to ten to one um, odds range. In which case, I would take a bet. Do I think simplification is better in this field than epicenter is? No, I don't. Well, then why would you bet it? Well, it's price. Because if I get more than I think its chances are, significantly more, like 10 to 1, I'll take that risk that the horses that ran second and fourth will reverse. Because it was only three lengths away. That's three-fifths of a second. That's a good blink of an eye. Okay. And as far as exotics, I'll box simplification and epicenter, the one eight. I'll take that box, and then my main punch will be a straight exacta with simplification on top. Why? I'm betting that the Derby finish where those two horses will reverse and get paid more than I should. Now, if I look at the probable exactas and they're really low on this combination, I'm not going to take it. Price dependent. Sure, I'll go fishing around. Uh, for trifectas, with all my reservations about it, I'll take Creative Minister. I'll even throw Happy Jack in and the tries and the supers. Why? Don't like the Wood Memorial horses. Don't, uh, don't like Secret Oath's chances against the boys, given what she did uh, at Oaklawn. Now, if any of those are wrong, I'm losing this race, but I'm going to get paid. In other words, I'm going to have an opportunity. Remember, simplification 
8, 9, 10 to 1, yep. And looking for uh, that Colt to upset, uh, a slight upset. I still think it'll be, I don't know what they're going to do past Epicenter, uh, although early voting should get action, Secret Oath should get action. Um, the wise guys may still be chasing the Wood Memorial, uh, and they may be right. And if so, I'm losing this bet. Okay. Now look, if you're watching out there, the fellow who said, I didn't come here for the undercard races, fine. Have a nice day. Don't forget to subscribe and like. Uh, but on big racing days, look, there's a lot of amateur money out there. Look at some of the undercards. You want to see a race that I'm interested in, that I'm going to be betting? I wish I could bet this right now. It's race nine at Pimlico on May 21st on Preakness Day. This is the kind of easy, no-brainer race. I don't have to go through each one and go, oh, what is the historical track profile? It's a simple six furlong race. It's the Chick Lang Stakes. All kinds of speed, early speed in the race. Okay, not only that, the morning line favorite is the five old homestead. It's an early horse. I'm not going to go through this all. You didn't come here for undercard races, but here you go. The second morning line favorite, Coburn, the one, had a very hard race last out. The third morning line favorite, Whelan Springs, also a very hard race, and it leaves one horse. A lot of hope that just ran a very nice close, very strong late fractions, uh, 15 to 1 morning line. You know, I get anywhere near a 50% overlay around 8 to 1. I'm betting this. This is the kind of race I would bet in the, almost bet in the morning and just, you know, let it go because I think it's going to be a price. I think they're going to be all over the 5, the 7, and the 1. And they're going to let a lot of hope go. Now we'll see. Maybe they've got the track souped up for uh, pre for the Preakness, and the closers won't <laughs> won't be doing well. In which case, I'll lose that bet. But from a price and value proposition, that's my undercard play. Well, thank you so much again. I can't tell you how much I appreciate spent you spending this time with me. You letting me express my thoughts about this great game. Um, I wish you luck on Preakness Day and always. And remember, although we're playing a game, we're playing for value. Not just the value in the price of the horses, but in the discipline to pass the races where there isn't any value, to pass the races where you absolutely agree with the public to pass the races where you don't have a felt sense about it. That's more difficult than any of this technical stuff about numbers and percentages and all of that. So have fun. Good luck at the races. Remember to wait for your prices and let the bet make you. I'll see you next time.